Right, good morning everyone. Nice to be with you this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn to John chapter 17. 17 verse 3 is just a text to introduce us to the topic this morning. I'm going to have you jump around a little bit, more like a Bible study. Today what I want to share with you is basically um, the key elements, the key elements that absolutely have to be present in a person's life in order to have a healthy, thriving, growing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the one question we really want to answer today is, how do I grow in my relationship with Christ? This is the, out of all the questions I get asked as a pastor in my travels or here locally, this one is one of the top asked questions. Yes, we've heard the story about Jesus. Yes, we like what Jesus has done for us. We, we even love him for what he has done. But how do, I, how do I nurture that relationship? How do I grow in my personal connection with Jesus? So that it's not just a, an intellectual faith, but that it is a heartfelt experience. Day to day, knowing the joy of the Lord, experiencing his presence, his power, his grace, knowing not just the theory of the truth, but the practical experience of the living truth, the living Jesus Christ in my life. That's kind of the direction that we're headed today with this presentation. And so in John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus makes this amazing statement, a very often quoted verse, and it says the following. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. What? This is eternal life, that they may know you. That they may know you. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is this thing called salvation, this idea of being saved from your sins, this idea of eternal life in paradise with God. It begins today, and it's a relational concept. It is not something that we, we hold out for, hoping to get to the end one day when we will know God. It's not something we look forward to in the new Jerusalem one day in heaven above. It's an experience to be gained today. This is eternal life. Eternal life starts today. Now, yes, we understand we may die that first death, what the Bible calls the first death, the death that every sinner will die in this life. But Jesus promises that if you are connected to himself, if you know him, if you are in relationship to him, then the promise is you have his life. And his life is the life of eternity. Therefore, though your earthly life may terminate for a period, your identity, your, your, your life is hid in Christ and he lives forever. Therefore, having Christ, you already have eternal life. Though you may sleep temporarily in the grave, your resurrection, your awakening from that sleep is guaranteed. So, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. How do I connect with Jesus? And to, to, to sort of get us headed in the right direction, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, looking right at the end of the, uh, of the chapter, and you find this amazing story, a well-known story. It's the story of Mary and Martha, two sisters. And these sisters are living together. Jesus passes through town one day, and he pops in to visit with them, actually to stay with them. You know the story well. So it's Luke chapter 10 from verse 38, and it reads as follows. Now it happened that as they went, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Now, just pause there for a moment and let me point out that in the society we live in today, which of these two sisters would have received our pat on the back? Martha, right? In a society such as ours, where, where, where we're all about work, 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 Martha would seem to be the one of greater character. Martha would seem to be the one whom we would pat on the back and say, well done, you are the example to us all. Now in this case, it's actually quite reversed, because it goes on to say in verse 41, Jesus answered Martha. Now, 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 now just, Martha is not asking for something unreasonable here. She's not asking for something bad here. She's not asking for the indulgence of a sinful pleasure here. All she's asking for is justice. 
All she's asking for is fairness. I mean, here she is slaving. She would love to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. But hey, someone's got to get the work done around here, right? So here she is. And who is she serving, by the way? She's serving Jesus. I mean, she is in the service of the master. She's welcomed the master into her home. She is doing everything that she is doing for him. This is a, this is a woman in missionary service, you could say, right? And here is her sister sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she's, you could say, almost reasonably is saying, Hey, Jesus, tell this lazy sister of mine to get up off her bum and come and help me to put in some graft with me because it's not fair that I'm doing all the hard work here, by the way, in your service. So tell my sister to get up and come and help me. Jesus answers and says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But you know what? Only one thing is truly needed. Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. You know what? This, pic this picture that's painted here of Jesus is that Jesus wants your attention more than he wants your labor. Jesus wants your attention more than he wants your labor. He wants your time to commune with him more than he wants you to be busy in the rat race running around, even if it is for him. He wants you to come aside, to rest in his presence, to commune with him. Now, he has an amazing concept for you. When we talk about the spiritual journey, when we talk about spiritual life, when we talk about this idea that in Christ it's power to overcome every cultivated and inherited tendency towards evil, that is the say, the sin that besets me, the weaknesses of my human flesh, that I can actually rise above that, becoming mighty and powerful in Christ, that I do not need to remain an addict, I do not need to remain ill-tempered, I do not need to remain any of the list of things that you would say is true of yourself in a sinful sense. How is it that we rise above our weaknesses? Now, he has a gem for you. It's not by trying harder. Did you get that? It's not by trying harder. It's by communing more intimately. Do you see the difference? You know, when you fall in sin, the tendency of the human flesh is to say, right, grit your teeth, pick yourself up, try harder next time. No, that's a system of works. You don't try harder to beat your sinful tendencies. You commune more intimately with Christ. When you are weak, when you are broken, when you are unable to rise above your weakness, what you need is time in the presence of God. You need to sit at the feet of Jesus like Mary. You need to connect with Christ. So we don't try harder. We commune more intimately. Does that make sense to you? So here's this picture. Number one in our journey with Christ, if you are going to grow in Christ from strength to strength, is a relationship takes time. And you know this, by the way. One of the significant things about what Jesus had said in John 17, verse 3, that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. The significant thing is that if it is a relationship with God, then the rules of relationship that you would apply between yourself and your spouse or yourself and your best friend or yourself and some other significant other person is going to apply to your relationship with Christ. And number one is time time. Any meaningful growing relationship requires the investment of time. Not just busyness, not just running around, connecting time. Number one in your journey with Christ. If you are too busy, if you are too rushed, that you cannot sit at the feet of Jesus to drink in his word, to to, to envelop yourself in his presence. If you cannot take time to connect with Christ, do not be surprised if you find yourself stagnating or even going backwards out of meaningful relationship with him, unable to sense his presence, no longer abiding in peace, no longer experiencing his power over weakness in your life. When you find yourself with any of that sort of diagnosis, first on your list, ask yourself, am I investing time in this relationship with Christ? Am I sitting at the feet of Jesus like Mary? Or am I rushing through life like Martha? And Jesus says, hey, number one, number one, what I want more than your service 
is your attention. But how do you fill that time? What, what do you do in practical terms to connect with God in this time? Let's say I was going to give a portion of my day to connect with Christ. What would that look like? Well, we carry on reading in chapter 11. It says from verse 1, It came to pass that as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, one of the obvious lessons that you get out of there straight away is prayer is actually an experience you can grow in. <laughs> Prayer is something that you can learn. Prayer is something you can, as it were, become better at. Now, now, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean the same thing in your human relationships. You can learn to communicate more effectively with the significant people in your life, right? You can learn over time to communicate more effectively. That's what prayer is. I'm communing with God. I'm communicating with God. How do I commune? How do I connect with God? Well, there was something about the example of Jesus here. There was something. His disciples are standing a little way off. Perhaps it's early in the morning. I don't know exactly. And they've come to find Jesus. And Jesus is where he usually is at that time of day. He's in prayer, con connecting with his Father, doing like Mary was doing with him. He's doing with his Father, getting his batteries recharged. He comes aside, he rests in the presence of his father, he talks, he opens his heart to God as to a friend. He's not merely going through the shopping list type prayer. He's not going through the same prayer today as he went through today, yesterday as he went through the day before. It's not a routine humdrum prayer. And how do I know that? Because there's something about the way Jesus is praying here that these disciples, these Jewish men, these men that had grown up in the presence of the synagogue, who had grown up with worship in their own homes, they had grown up amongst the religious leaders. There's something, they've heard prayer, they've heard prayer again and again and again. They've participated in prayer again and again and again. These were not Gentile men, these were his own disciples, Jewish men, men that were uh, um, familiar shall we say, with the religious environment. And there's something so significant, significantly different about the way Jesus is praying that they come to him and they say to him, teach us to pray like that. You know, we, we know how to pray. But this kind of prayer, there's something dynamic about it. There's something enjoyable about it. There's something powerful about it. Teach us to pray like that. We don't just want to go through the religious motions. We don't want to do this thing called prayer that, that, that doesn't engage our minds and our hearts. This thing that we do out of religious duty and this thing that we do out of responsibility and this thing that we do perhaps even out of a guilty conscience. No, Jesus is experiencing a dynamic of prayer here that even those who are listening from a distance said, there is something happening there. It's as if God's actually alive. It's as if the one he's talking to is real. Christ knew how to open his heart to his father in a way that was powerful, real, almost tangible. And anybody who heard him pray could sense that there was something different. He goes on to give the, 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 the prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is his prayer of instruction. This is not what he intended them to repeat verbatim every time they prayed. But when you take that prayer and you analyze it, you learn what meaningful prayer is. Hallowed be thy name, recognizing the holiness and the greatness of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Submission to God. Give us this day our daily bread, the, the dependence upon God for our, for our earthly needs. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God, have mercy upon me. Take my heart. Make me a forgiving channel so that I will know the joy not only of being forgiven, but forgiving others in a like manner. There's this just openness to God that flows out of the, the prayer of instruction here that Jesus gives to his disciples. And the Bible tells us that time and time again, Jesus would withdraw from the crowds to spend a whole night in prayer. Now, now, I have often wondered how you spend a whole night in prayer. And I cannot spend a whole night in prayer the way I pray. To spend a whole night in prayer, you would have to be praying an experience that was living and vital. I mean, you can tolerate dead prayer for 15 or 20 minutes. But a whole night... 
One of the key ingredients in a living experience with Jesus Christ is real, heartfelt prayer. Sitting at the feet of Jesus there like Mary, opening up to him, being completely honest and transparent, talking to him about anything and everything that is a part of your life. It's not about learning prayers. It's not about a routine. It's not about a certain verbal formula. It's about being open and transparent completely with God. Whether that looks nice or whether it looks kind of yucky doesn't matter. Just giving Him your all in prayer. One of the key ingredients in your earthly relationships that makes them meaningful with the people that you have meaningful relationships with is the fact that you don't have to fake it with them. Is the fact that you can say anything to them, you can tell them your deepest, darkest secrets, and they do not judge you for it. They do not condemn you for it, but they will be there to come alongside you through the midst of that darkness. That's what prayer is supposed to be like with God. Because here's the idea. On the cross, He already saw the darkest part of your life. There's nothing you can confess or open up to God about that He hasn't already seen on the cross 2,000 years ago. The only thing you risk in not being intimate and open and transparent and honest with God in prayer, the only thing you really risk is that you don't connect with Him. But you do not risk anything when you are completely honest with Him. Ingredient number one in your time with God is open, honest, transparent prayer. The kind of prayers that are not rushed, the kind of prayers that are not merely shopping lists for the things of earth that you want, but the kind of prayers that make your heart, your mind, your very soul, the innermost recesses of your being available to God. I want you to jump over to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 reveals something powerful to us about God as well, about Jesus and his experience. It's a well-known story. It's the story of Jesus facing off with the devil in the wilderness of temptation. Forty days and forty nights have passed. He's been fasting, no eating, no drinking. It's an, what we might call an extreme fast. And here the enemy comes to him in his weakest moment and tempts him. The very first temptation, we're not going to run through them all, but the, the very first temptation, you can understand the power of this temptation after forty days of no eating and drinking. The very first temptation is, if you are the Son of God, if you are what you claim to be, then it's no problem for you to alleviate your own hunger. Take these stones and turn them into bread. If you the creator if you are the son of God then do something with that power serve yourself serve yourself and Jesus turns around to the enemy and he says in verse 4 it how does it go it is written and he quotes scripture the next temptation it is written the third temptation it is is written. Question, did Jesus have to pull out his iPad? Did Jesus have to do a word search? Did he have to Google that verse that sounds something like Google, 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 Google? All oh, right, yeah, I can use that. Did Jesus have to even take out the scroll of his day and look it up? You know, what this little story illustrates here, while it's not quite the main point of that story, what it does illustrate to us is that Jesus knew the Scriptures well enough that He could quote them from memory. He had an experience with God that obviously involved the Word of God in a very significant way. He wasn't a casual reader of the Word. He didn't, he didn't struggle to know where what was fi found is found and where you'd find this and where you'd find... Obviously, as he had grown up, he was saturated with the Word. Obviously, as he spent time with God, a significant amount of that time was spent in the Word, hearing the voice of God to his soul. Did Jesus pray and open his being to God? Yes, absolutely. Did Jesus allow God to speak honestly and truly into his being through the word? Absolutely. Ingredient number two in your time with God is availing yourself of the word of God. And what does that look like? It may look like Bible reading. It may look like Bible study. And there's a difference between reading and studying and both have their place. 
in studying, we're digging deeper. We may even be using tools like concordances and Greek and Hebrew tools and all sorts of strange, weird and wonderful things to really mine the depths of a verse. In reading, we're getting the broad overview, seeing the beauty of the story, following the overall patterns of what's happening. We read scripture, we mine it for truth, we study it. We, we may even take a, a, a one-year study program and, and say, I want to get through the Bible from beginning to end this year. Download it off the internet, and if you want one that's really good, find a year's reading uh, plan that doesn't take you through it, you know, five verses from each, ch five chapters from each book every day sequentially. And the reason you don't want to do that is because when you get to the chapters that involve the genealogies or some of the more boring parts of Scripture, you're not going to get much out of your reading that morning possibly, and you're going to be tempted to lay it aside thinking, what's the point of this? What you want is a reading plan that takes a portion of the Old Testament and a portion of the New Testament and a portion of the Psalms in one reading per day. That way, when you encounter something that's a little bit dry and boring in one portion of the Scriptures, when you flip over to the other portion of the Scriptures on the same day, your soul is still going to be nourished. You take a plan like that, that's a practice practical suggestion for you as to how you can read the Bible through in a meaningful way every day, connecting with God, drinking in His Word, and don't rush. Just like prayer, take time to hear the significance of the passage. Take time to question the passage. Anyone can read a story. Not everyone understands the significance of the story. What's the difference between the two readers? The one is involving their mind and their heart, questioning, interrogating that pa passage. Not just reading the story and going, wow, that happened 2,000 years ago, that's interesting. Not quite sure what relevance it has to me, let's move on. They're interrogating the, the, the passage. They're seeing themselves in the story. They're identifying personalities and characters. They're there watching the whole thing in technicolor. They're involved in the story. You've got to commune with God, opening your heart to Him in prayer. You've got to hear His voice speaking to you through His Word. Read it, study it, pray it. Combine the prayer and the study of the Word in such a way that you, you, you don't just pray before you read and pray after you read, or perhaps none of that, but you, you, you instead of praying in categories, instead of your devotional routine looking like you pray, you study, a little bit of prayer, it's segmented. Make it all one. Talk to God about what He's talking to you about in your Word. Take the Scriptures, and as they address you, address God. When they speak to you about the things of your heart that you need to surrender, surrender them. Argue with God if you have to. Wrestle with God if you have to. Engage God through His Word as He engages you through, through His Word. You know, one of the things that drives me nuts in my own prayer experience, one of the things that, where I know I've got to change things is when I get into that shopping list mentality of prayer, that, that routine that I mentioned earlier on, the same thing today as yesterday as the day before. You know, the quickest way to break that is to take the word and say to the Lord, Lord, bless me as I read, read your word today. Start reading and speak to him about what he speaks to you about. Somehow we get this idea that, in, that, that, that prayer is just all me unloading on God. Now that may be a portion of prayer, but a very valid portion of prayer is stopping to hear the voice of God. Like any conversation, if all you do is do the, the, do the talking, you're not going to be blessed by the other person who wants to speak into your life. Take time to hear the Word of God and talk to Him about the subjects He raises with you from His Word. Suddenly prayer comes alive because suddenly prayer is not the same thing today as the day before, as the day before, as the day before. It's dynamic. It changes because the topics God raises with you will vary according to the passages that you're reading and applying to your life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, that they may spend time in your presence, that, that, that they may commune with you, opening their heart to you, Lord. And that they may hear you speaking into their lives through your word. This is eternal life. This is the joy of the Lord. This is where peace comes from. This is where the sense of the presence of God comes from. This is where the mind is subdued and the things of earth drift farther and farther out of sight. Another passage I want to share with you is further down in Luke chapter 4. It starts in verse 16. 
And it's the story of Jesus and his weekly experience of corporate worship. Luke chapter 4 verse 16 says, and this is after the temptations, right? So Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And then the Bible says, as his what? As his custom was, he went into the synagogue. That's the Jewish church, right? As his custom was, Jesus showed up with his brothers and sisters to worship corporately together on the Sabbath day. As his custom was, he entered into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. I want you to notice this. As his custom was. Jesus was not a sporadic churchgoer. He was not a let's have a look at the weather and see what it's doing kind of a churchgoer. He wasn't someone tick me off at church so I don't think I'm going to go today kind of a churchgoer. Jesus was as his custom was. That means you could set your watch by it. Oh, Jesus is off to church. Must be Saturday morning, 9.30, right? Or whatever time they went to synagogue. As his custom was, this was what he did on a regular basis. It was predictable. Jesus had a need to connect with other people. Now, that wasn't the only time he worshipped. We've already established he was constantly in the Word. He was constantly in prayer. But here's the idea. Church, church is the highlight of your weekly worship experience. In fact, I want to go so far as to say this. This is a little bit of an aside, but bear with me here. If you come to church and you find that church is dull, boring, and uninteresting, the chances are I would be willing to bet money on it. You have not connected with God during the week. You know, we come to church and we, we blame the preacher and we blame the musicians and we blame the organization. And hey, let's face it, there are times we can do things differently and do things better. No doubt about that. But here's the key idea. When you connect with other people on the Sabbath morning on a spiritual level, you have to be tuned in through the previous week on that spiritual level. I would, be, I would be willing to bet that most people who find church dull, boring, and uninteresting, it's because they're disconnected from God fundamentally through the previous days of the week. So when you come to church and you find yourself in a spiritual environment, it takes you half the morning just to get the frequency tuned in again to begin to hear the voice of God, and then it's all over. I challenge you. See church not as your primary worship experience. See it as the highlight of your weekly worship experience, the culmination. I imagine the kind of spiritual life that would flow through a local congregation when every single one of its members were living the weekly experience with Christ in the marketplace, in their homes, wherever they find themselves, living in the presence and the joy and the, and the, and the experience of the power of God throughout the week. How can a Saturday morning worship experience not be enlivened and revitalized by a church which is made up of people? When you criticize the church for being dead, it is often because the individual is dead. Or the majority of individuals are dead. Because at the end of the day, when you criticize the church, you're criticizing a thing of which you are a living part of. Do you hear what I'm saying? As his custom was... Now, I want you to jump to the end of this little passage here. It's a very, very interesting, um, what shall we call it? a little interesting observation here. Verse 28. So Jesus stands up, he reads, he does his thing, and uh, the message he happens to preach gets a few people, to say the least, ticked off. Now, verse 28. So all those in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with what? Wrath. Now, that's not mild discontent. That's not even anger. Wrath is the kind of word you use when it's over the top extreme. Does that make sense? The men, the, the, all the people in the synagogue were filled with wrath. They rose up. They thrust him out of the city. That means with pushing and cajoling and, and unkindness. Are you with me? They, 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 they thrust him out of the city. They led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. I would be willing to bet that even if you have experienced some things in church that are not pleasant, that in our society, your life has never yet been threatened at church. 
Uh, somebody might not have greeted you right. There might not be a friendly enough environment for your taste. It might be that you've even suffered something significant like... Some